In this presentation, we will trace the evolution of paint temperature control from its origins to the modern systems of today. Why did it become necessary in the first place? What were the contributing factors and how did they drive the development of the original systems? We'll look at how changes in both paint chemistry and the automotive marketplace transform the fundamental purpose for temperature control from protecting the paint to improving finish quality. Finally, we'll examine why paint temperature control is still necessary, focusing on the resulting changes in temperature control technologies and comparing and contrasting the old approach and the new approach. So let's start with the origins of paint temperature control. Why did it become necessary in the first place? Let's start with large, long circulation systems circulating paint at high flow rates. Furthermore, these were often routed in the truss level where elevated temperatures are the norm. The alternative occasionally explored was trench routing, which had the problem of reduced temperatures. Regardless of where the piping was routed, it was still subject to seasonal influences that caused variation in the temperature of the paint supplied to the booth. But a major culprit was the vertical turbine pump. Depending on the number of bowls and the system pressure, often a function of system length, these pumps can add as much as 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit to the paint on each pass through. And this kind of heat buildup could quickly drive off solvent and even cook the paint. And paint was expensive back then, just like it is today. So the mantra became, protect the paint. This was accomplished with temperature control systems scaled to the paint systems they were managing. They were large, often consuming entire rooms, and they employed a variety of different heat exchanger designs and a host of various ancillary equipment like hot and cold water generators, tank and pumping skids, etc. But there was change on the horizon, and it was coming from every angle. There were changes in paint chemistry. Originally, all paints were solvent-based, in an effort to be more environmentally friendly, waterborne formulations were introduced. Since these were based on water, and water is more stable than solvent, folks came to believe the myth that waterborne formulations are less sensitive to changes in temperature than solvent-borne formulations. In fact, some of the most sensitive paint formulations we've ever worked with were waterborne. One prime example was found at the GM Lansing Craft Center. They were offering the Cadillac Eldorado with a pearlescent rose finish, and it was beautiful. It consisted of a rose-tinted clear applied over a white mica waterborne base coat, and it looked just like the name described, and it was popular too. The problem was that the mica base coat turned to cottage cheese when it got above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and the piping from the mix room to the base coat booth ran over the ovens up into the truss level. You can just imagine what happened every summer in July and August as the temperatures outdoors exceeded 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the formulations have gotten even more exotic. In addition to waterborne, there's 2Ks, UV cures, and a host of others. But paint formulations weren't the only changes the industry was facing. There was increased competition, not just from the domestic companies, but increasingly from foreign automakers. This created downward pressure on prices and therefore margins. In response, the industry turned to automation. This was the age of the robot and they were being used for every repetitive task that engineers could find. This was a no-brainer in the application of fasteners, a perfect application to be automated. But on things like painting, where perfect repetition seemed like a natural, the loss of eye-hand coordination turned out to be a major problem. All this at a time when the customer was becoming more sophisticated. They expected higher quality, not just in the workings of their cars, but also in the fit and finish. They're looking for this. And we're supplying this, even today. So what is wrong with this picture? There are two things. The orange peel, of course. But this is on TV, in an advertisement touting Chrysler's product. And this has the same problems. And it seems pervasive. Everybody's affected. This is particularly bad because this appeared on Automotive News TV and it was broadcast primarily to a group of industry professionals, all of whom are qualified to judge this is unacceptable. And even worse, all of these were painted in facilities with paint temperature control. And it gets even more complicated. Each of these photos showed just one part of the vehicle. 
but it's no longer just about painting the body. There's a multiplicity of substrates to deal with. In addition to steel, there's aluminum, plastics, composites, and a host of other materials, all fabricated in different facilities, often in different countries, yet all of the finishes have to match perfectly. So let's examine why temperature is at the root of all these issues. We start with the basic foundation on which modern temperature control is built. It's all about viscosity. All liquids change viscosity as a function of temperature. Even water goes through a viscosity change of 2 to 1 between 10 and 40 degrees C. You probably don't think of a glass of ice water being thicker than a cup of coffee, but it is. And all paints follow this same pattern. In fact, this is a steeper curve than displayed by common solvents, so there goes the old claim that waterboard and paints aren't affected by temperature. It's important to note that this is a physical property, not a defect, and therefore we can use it to our advantage in our process. So here's the viscosity versus temperature curve for a typical Valspar polyester paint. It's the typical curve we're all familiar with, the nonlinear relationship, the viscosity falling as the temperature increases. And Valspar recommends that this coating be applied at a viscosity of 26 seconds. If we extend this over to the curve and down, we can see that it correlates to a temperature of 28 degrees C. This means as long as the paint is held at exactly 28 degrees C, it will be at the optimal coating viscosity. But how often does that happen? Right, almost never. So they give us a tolerance of plus or minus two seconds. Again, if we extend this over to the curve and down, we can see that this corresponds to a three degrees C temperature range from 26.5 degrees C to 29.5 degrees C. So long as we stay within this relatively narrow temperature window, it's about 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, we should be okay. But what most people don't realize is that this varies from formulation to formulation. Now these are all the same paint. The only difference is the color. But we can see that, though all of these are designed on the same resin base, there are large variations in performance due to the differences in pigments, fillers, additives, etc. So just for the sake of argument, let's suppose that we want to use each one of these at 26 seconds in our painting application. We will have to adjust the viscosity by adding solvent, and how much depends on the temperature we're at. Or, we will have to hold each color at a different temperature. The black at 21 degrees C. The muslin in warm beige at 24 degrees C. The charcoal at about 26 and a half degrees C, and the putty just north of 29. The factors that affect paint temperature include the area ambient temperature and the temperature at which the paint is stored, the volume of paint in that source container, and the flow rate that the paint is being recirculated at, not to mention the path through which it's being recirculated, and the pressure required to get it through that path. This determines the pump type and horsepower. And then there's the effect of shear in the system due to regulators, nozzles, fittings, etc. These factors account for the differences in the rate of temperature change and often result in an increase over ambient. Shear is important because friction and shear equal heat. And this is the reason that simply controlling ambient temperature is usually not effective. So let's look at the impact of temperature on finish. The impact of temperature can be divided into two categories. First, on process, where it affects atomization, transfer efficiency, film build, flow out, cure rate, and this results in unpredictable setups and variations during a run. And next, on quality, where it impacts dry film build, run and sag, orange peel, gloss issues, color shift. This often results in blistering and pop and poor adhesion. This is readily demonstrated when we look at finish quality. The primary defect that we showed in the photos on slides 9, 10, and 11 was orange peel. So why is orange peel such an issue? It's obvious. And by that I mean it's obvious to everybody, with the naked eye. Color shift is hard to detect. One person's gloss is another person's semi-gloss. 
but orange peel is obvious to the untrained eye. So if we all agree that this is bad and needs to be eliminated, or at least controlled, we need a good way to evaluate it, a method to measure it. Originally, orange peel was evaluated by comparing the finish with a visual standard. This set was made by ACT and was the most commonly used standard. This set of 10 panels allowed the finish to be graded in 10 steps and was as accurate as the operator using it and the lighting allowed. But as engineers, we needed a more reliable number, a more objective number, one that's not dependent on an operator or the available light. Enter the BIC wave scan. This handheld gadget uses laser light to measure the variations in the surface finish. It breaks them down into two components, short wave and long wave, and their relationship with temperature is very interesting. Here we see the optimal long wave performance at approximately 21 degrees C. And here we see the optimal short wave performance at just above 23 degrees C. This is virtually an inversion of the long wave graph. Note that these two plots cover the same 19 to 25 degrees C temperature range and also three steps of wave scan range. If we take these two data sets and plot them on the same graph, we can see the interaction, which represents orange peel versus temperature. This shows the balance point to optimize both long wave and short wave parameters occurring at about 22.3 degrees C. Increasing in temperature towards 24 degrees C will optimize short wave performance over long wave. Conversely, reducing the temperature towards 21 degrees C will optimize long wave performance over short wave. With all other variables held constant, we can use coating temperature to control the orange peel of our finish. This provides total control over surface finish. It also explains why there's this nominal 3 degree sweet spot for finish quality that's always been the rule of thumb. The last parameter provided by the wave scan is DOI, which stands for distinctness of image. Think of this as a measurement of how close the finish is to a mirror. Here we can see that the DOI remains above the 86 minimum value throughout this entire temperature range and therefore is not of concern when optimizing shortwave and longwave performance. The goal then is to control the viscosity of the paint at the point of application, which in spray systems is the nozzle orifice. And it doesn't matter whether you're using a gun or a bell, but that's a topic for a whole separate presentation. The real question is, does the temperature of the paint really change all that much? We expect a paint system with no temperature control to display temperature variation, and here we can see just that. The clear coat temperature actually increases by a full 5 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the ambient only increases by 3 degrees Fahrenheit. The remaining 2 degrees is due to other factors we talked about, primarily friction caused by shear. But we expect a system with temperature control to hold much closer. And yet, here we see more than 8 degrees Fahrenheit total variation during painting over a 5 day period. Note that the painting temperatures are shown in red and the solvent purge temperatures in blue. This shows the point of application temperature is not a constant function of the heat exchanger temperature. In fact, it appears to be more a function of ambient. The impact on finish quality is easier to see when we zoom in so we can see individual painting cycles. Here we can see that, during the course of the process, there are four distinct actions happening. First, there's painting, and there's idle time, there's solvent purge, and then there's the restart after the solvent purge. Moreover, we can see the impact that cold solvent has on the delivery system, but again, that's also a topic for another presentation. What's really important is the variation that we see during the painting cycle. Because of the temperature change during the idle time, the first 25% of the vehicle is being clear coated under continuously varying conditions. Clearly, not good process control and variable results are inevitable. So we have to ask the question, do we still need paint temperature control? The answer is obviously yes, but then what did you expect me to say? But the new market reality has created a shift in the fundamental purpose behind temperature control. The idea of protecting the paint, 
while still extremely important, has given way to the need to improve finish quality. But this requires that we control the temperature of the paint as it is being applied. We call this point of application temperature control and it defines the modern systems of today. Point of application temperature control is both a philosophy and a process. We define it in five simple steps. First, think backwards from everyone else. Next, acknowledge that the only material of concern is that actually being applied to the part. Next, start at the point of application and work backwards, adding temperature control until all conditions can be satisfied. And then stop. The need to control temperature at the point of application requires that the temperature control be moved into the booth. This required some new devices like the recorable coax hose and the reapplication of SES's proven trace cover technology. The recorable coax hose is a flexible tube and tube heat exchanger. This is an advancement from SES's original coax hose technology developed for sealer and adhesive applications. This new design allows the core tube, usually Teflon, to be easily replaced in the field. This is available in both conductive and non-conductive versions for use in electrostatic applications. Now this is a typical recorable coax hose implementation in a 2K gun spray application. Note that the temperature control extends all the way to the gun. And here is the typical recorable coax hose implementation in a 2K bell spray application. Note how these are routed inside the robot arm. And then there's SES's patented profile trace covers. These convert pipe or header into a tube and tube heat exchanger. These can be used inside the booth or outside the booth in a circulation system application. The best part of these is that they require no intrusion into the paint system to install. They are simply wrapped around the pipe and fastened with a Velcro closure. SES's renowned trace cover technology allows odd shaped, flexible, or high motion components to be covered and controlled as well. And here we can see all of the trace cover technologies used together to control a piping system. This is a great example of how versatile this technology is. While in-booth point-of-application technology is the newest addition to the paint temperature control stable, circulation system temperature control is not obsolete. As I demonstrated with the GM Craft Center Pearlesson example, new paint technologies are more sensitive than ever and still require protection. When combined with in-booth control, this can assure long-term success with any coating on any substrate. The bottom line is that if the parameters of a proven painting recipe are held constant, the resulting surface finish will be consistent and repeatable. And aren't those two terms that we really want associated with our process? I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me for this presentation. Though we've only scratched the surface of the subject of temperature control in painting processes and the impact that it has on quality and performance, we hope that this cursory introduction has given you a different window through which to view your operation. We encourage you to contact us to gain a more in-depth perspective of how you can reduce costs, improve quality, and shorten your production cycle by controlling the temperature variable in your painting system.